Hi, what's up everybody? David Parsons here. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Nostalgia Trap program. Uh, got a great guest for you today. My guest is Natalia Melman Petrozella. She is an associate professor of history at the New School in New York City and the author of a new book that's all about exercise and American culture. It's called Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. And I actually became aware of this book and Professor Petrozella's work uh, through her being the subject of a really unfortunate social media kerfluffle, dust up. What do we call those? Uh, when people get targeted by uh, all sorts of malicious uh, online creatures, whether they be from uh, right wing circles or not. I mean, it just kind of happens. The whole gang up thing. This happened with uh, with her book. There was a, I think it was a CNN article or interview that basically had this awful headline about like exercise is racist, and this professor will tell you why. And it got picked up by right wing media. I mean, even fucking Donald Trump Jr. was talking about this shit. And of course, what it ends up doing is completely distorting the work and what it's actually about, which is, you'll find out in this conversation, a really deep and compelling take on how the idea of exercise and physical fitness has evolved in American culture. Does that have racist roots? Yeah, in part, and she's going to tell us about some of that, but it's just the distortion of the clickbait headline plus the right-wing media influencer shitheads that sort of pick that stuff up and I think willfully distort it to their dumb audience. Um, I knew when I saw all that stuff that there was a deeper story and I wanted to tell the story on Nostalgia Trap. So I invited her on the podcast and we had a really fun conversation about her book and that conversation is what today's episode is all about. So I hope you enjoy this. There's lots more Nostalgia Trap stuff out there. I've been putting up more episodes of Trap TV, which are basically just my own ideas about history. Lately, I've been talking a lot about film noir and noir as kind of a larger framework for thinking about American history, particularly in our time. Like we live in kind of a dark noir America. Uh, and I wanted to think about what that means. So if you want to check out that stuff, plus all of our live streams with Justin Rogers Cooper, tons of other th uh, other episodes of Campus Trap with Ryan Boyd, uh, Gender Trap with Yasmin Nair, which we'll be putting up later this week, an episode with her uh, talking about Chinatown. That one is uh, really fun. So if you want to check out any of that stuff and support our program, we really appreciate it. The link is in the episode description, but it's patreon.com slash nostalgia trap and enjoy this conversation. Here is me talking with Natalia Melman Petrozella. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Your book caught my attention. Um, it's called Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. You know, as an academic, it's it, thinking about exercise and thinking about the body is something that's uh, I've spent a lot of time doing. I mean, I don't even know where I, I, I'm not sure where to start with your with your book, because you've got like you've got so many things going on in terms of talking about what exercise and how health and the body fit into today, like today's American culture, but then this longer <laughs> periodization. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s when the culture was all about like jocks and nerds. And there was really like this split between these two things. And I, and I recognize this from reading your book, um, you also had this sort of like split where you didn't know who to be. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like that split is kind of key to what you're getting into. Yeah. So jocks and nerds, I guess, is a more <laughs> colloquial way of talking about the mind, mind, body dualism that Descartes first talked about. Right. And so that framing is really core to this book. And a lot of the story that I tell in the U in the U S is the story of like how fitness went from this weird thing to being something that everybody's expected to do. And that theoretically makes you a good person. And that trajectory has everything to do with the U S be going from becoming a culture where we most Mostly thought pursuits of the body were sort of like base and suspicious and carnal and like not elevated at all to being a culture where we're like, we kind of 
all buy into this holistic sense that mind and body are connected. If you want to be a fully actualized person, you've got to work on your body, which creates mental clarity, both kind of emotionally and intellectually um, and morally even. And so that's really the kind of story that I'm telling. And, mm. you know, not to give too much away, I'll probably get into it, but a lot of that shift starts to really happen in a really meaningful way in like the 60s and 70s. So by the time that I think both of us were growing up, mm -hmm. we still were kind of in that jocks and nerds perspective, but really in the 90s, especially as yoga becomes super mainstream, that's really like bidding goodbye to this notion that you had to apologize for working on your body because it like detracted from the life of the mind. But um, yeah. Yeah. And, and yoga, it's funny because yoga, you know, thinking about the 60s and 70s and the kind of like hippie counterculture, you know, they were already doing yoga and, and some of the beat people were doing it in the fifties and sixties. Um, but, but, but it brings it full circle because there's this kind of like Eastern mysticism, cultural element crashing into it as well. But yeah, I'm thinking about like just the popular conception of where exercise comes from. Uh, seems like it's a, 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 a the 1970s are a key moment. Um, and the four, I'm thinking about the, the scene in Forrest Gump where, where he runs across the country and like grows uh -huh. a huge beard for years. Like that scene, I always took about like, this is about jogging. This is about mm -hmm. like the sixties are over where, where, you know, everything failed. And we're now like kind of retreating into like this sort of like, you know, work on ourselves thing. It's, and, and I feel like your story is a lot longer than that. Yes, it's definitely a lot longer, but just to pause on the 70s and that framing that you just brought up, that's a very popular framing. This notion that like, you know, the kind of radicalism of the 1960s, which was all about political reform and kind of collective action, that there's a failure and a kind of disappointing decline of that collective social vision and what embodies it. Well, these embodied practices like jogging, like yoga, like meditation, like organic food, all these things that are about um, as those Critics say, you know, forgetting about the broader social good and just focusing on feeling good and it's improving Jane yourself. Fonda. It's like literally like Jane Fonda going from radical anti-war activist in the 60s to um, what we were introduced to Jane Fonda as, which is like an exercise guru on videotapes in the 80s. Yes, but I push back on that framing. So I think there's something to it. And I'm not saying that fitness culture and wellness culture is not without narcissism. My God, there's a lot of narcissism <laughs> in there. But I really can't stand the idea that all of these kind of bodily practices are dismissed as like just silly acts of narcissism. Yes. I think that's totally yes. wrong. And that's a lot of what I am trying to do in this book. And I mean, Jane Fonda is a good example of that. She saw group fitness as a feminist space. It was time. Tom Hayden, her husband, mm -hmm. who she was funding through her workout, by the way, who um, kind of dismissed this as like these silly ladies doing exercise when actually there was some really pretty important stuff that was happening in there and in other similar places. So that is a big part of the book. Um, you asked me to step back to this longer story. Well, yes, it stretches far before Jane Fonda and ends basically today. And a funny note on that, I think like so many of us, I was really delayed with the pandemic and finishing this. And I was like, hating myself for this. And then now I'm like, thank God I got to write that post-pandemic chapter because everything would seem a little dated, even in yeah. a history book, yeah. if I didn't get there. So I go, I, you could start this uh, a bunch of places. Um, I started this on the stage of the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 with a strong man named Eugene Sandow, who is posing for one of many packed crowds that he welcomed um, to his theater. And the idea there is one just to set this incredible scene of this Prussian born strong man who's like all powdered up like he is a um, classical statue and he's flexing and people are like, oh, you know, women line up to like touch mm -hmm. his body. And there's a lot going on there. But one of the things that I think is so relevant about what's going on there is that this is exercise as a performance. Like this is people going to look at this weirdo who's kind of aspirational, but they don't have any of that feeling that we do, I think, or many people do today, which is like, oh, I should work out. Or that reminds me I should get to the gym. It's just not part of it. You're actually kind of a freak if you're spending that much time um, working on your body. And so that's kind of where it starts. And I go from there all the way to really like the late pandemic pandemic moment that we're in when I stopped writing, which was, I don't know, less than a year ago now, um, where, you know, we've had this 
Pelotonization of uh, private exer space and the workout world, and also you know inequality is a huge uh, through line in this book here. And if anything, sadly, the pandemic has made fitness inequality something I care deeply about um, identifying and redressing much, 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 much worse as kind of mm-hmm. public recreation was sort of first to close, last to reopen with the pandemic, and we're still seeing the impact of that. I know, and I think California and in New York City and oh, lots yeah. of other places. Yeah, I mean. The pandemic, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about working from home, right? And how the home became a space where now I have to have an office at home and the, the class dimensions of that. I mean, you have to have a home, first of all, to work mm-hmm. from home. And the same with gym. I mean, I live in, I'm in a suburban neighborhood where I've seen, I can see actually right now, uh, people in the backyard across from me um, in their home gym, that they're their outdoor home gym that they've built in the backyard. Um, and it seems like that's, I mean, the class dynamic of that is pretty clear. It seems like if you don't have the space for it, then you can't have a home gym. And, th- and those Pelotons aren't cheap either. Oh, no. And I use Peloton as a sort of stand in for like all kinds of home fitness um, equipment. But yeah, there's this everything is classed about what you're saying. Like, first of all, you have to have a job that allows you to work from home to even be working from right, home. Right? right. So there's that. Then there's the if you do have that kind of job, you, of course, probably primarily are setting up your workspace from home. And then when everything sort of moved inside, it's a bonus to be able to have the space to actually exercise at home as well. And so it was really interesting in the pandemic to to first see, you know, who kind of like Bert was able to be at home, but then also like I could not stand some of the finger wagging, honestly, from the left primarily at people who were outside gathering, running, going to beaches, parks, like, oh, they're so terrible. How dare they do that? And it's like, okay, well, I'm happy you have your backyard and your squat rack and whatever you're using, but actually public recreational space is something that a lot of people need in order to get the thing that you can afford in a private form. And, um, you know, you you didn't ask about this, but I'll just say it. Like I'm foremost a political historian. And one of the things that was so interesting to me about this story is the way that like conventional um, presumptions about what's right and left kind of get shaken up throughout yes. the history of exercise. I mean, the pandemic's a good example of that. Like all those people on the left being like, close the playgrounds, close the beaches, close the parks. Well, I'm in my little private space. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Republicans do that. And so right, I think, right. um, you know, and I, I'm, I am being judgy here, but um, I think that's just something <laughs> that's we should okay. think about, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And I mean, the, the urban element is important too. I mean, where people live and how they're, I, I mean, if, if you, if you have outdoor space available to you or not is, is, is pretty key here. Um, but it's, it seems like, you know, when you're thinking about uh, uh, living in, living in a city with, uh, with, uh, with limited space, um, uh, uh, the the exercise element becomes really really critical. I'm wondering about um that that longer history. I love the Chicago World's Fair stuff and and the the idea of like a bodybuilder. Where does that where does that come from and and, and how does that change? Because you're saying like you know how does it go from like you're looking at a muscle bound dude as a freak to now you know I think I look at muscle bound dudes and I'm I'm supposed to think I should look like that right? That's yeah. some sort of ideal. Totally. So, I mean, it's a long story that I tell over 400 pages in my new book, <laughs> Fit Nation, but to give you a bit of a, a taste of kind of the way that argument unfolds. So people like Eugene Sandow, the guy who was on stage there and Charles Atlas, who a lot of people have probably heard of too, who are, he's also like one of these early strong men. And they do a lot of work to kind of sanitize the reputation of working on your body as something kind of positive and aspirational. And it's really, really over the top the way that they do it. I mean, Sandow, that was a good example. He is, he, he writes like memoirs and he's like very vocal. Um, and he goes to great lengths to kind of emphasize the way that his work, deliberate strength training, sets him apart from what he calls mere breakers of stones. And so there's like a whole class and sort of intellectual Mm. superiority dimension there of like, I engage in this deliberate strength training. I'm not like these like big louts who just lift heavy stuff. Like we're very different. And he's constantly telling these stories and honestly performing with bigger people who he like overpowers with his strength. And he's trying to show like, this is smart training. It's super racialized. I mean, this is something that um, a lot of people don't want to think about because it's like the gym, it's just objectively good. Like, no, it's complicated. Um, 
And yeah, it's really racialized. And one of these uh, groups of people who really embodies like the quote unquote mere breakers of stones are recently emancipated enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, yeah. Southern and Eastern European immigrants. And he's kind of trying to present this as like a white civilization project. There is an anecdote worth, I think, um, you know, recapping at, at, you know, at a little bit of length here, which I think really shows it where Sandow talks about the first time that he comes to New York and he's doing a show and um, he gets into a hotel and Manhattan. And it seems that it's the first time he's seen a black person. And there's a black bellhop there who takes his bag. So is, you know, tasked with carrying the bags for this like strong guy. And they get up to the room and this bellhop like apparently sits down on his couch and like pulls out a cigarette and is sort of disrespectful to him. And he is like, you know, he says things like this disrespect is too much for white flesh to bear. And it's like this whole superiority thing. And then listen to this. So he says that what he did is he picked up the bellhop by his lapels and held him over a 16 floor stairwell and kind of like, sh- like basically shook um, like some sense into him as people were apparently standing around. And he says in the book, and then he says, well, I let him go. I said, like, don't you ever um, like treat a white person like this? But what he says in the book is, you know, I was in control the whole time. I picked him up. I wanted to show him that I could do this. And if I wanted to, I could, you know, release him and kill him. But obviously I wasn't going to do that. And I think it's so interesting because it's so deliberate to show like, well, I'm training in this deliberate way, but it's from a place of control, not like animalistic rage. And I'm using that to kind of uphold the racial hierarchy. So that is like super interesting. So he goes to great lengths in that way. Mm. Also, he and a bunch of others, um, probably a little less successfully, are constantly saying effectively, like, we're not gay, (laughs) we're heterosexual, Mm -hmm. although that term wasn't used at the time, um, because part of this mind-body dichotomy was very much presuming that men who worked on their bodies and chose to do that and spend time with other men, these were suspicious dudes. Like a kind of normal man who's attracted to women wouldn't spend so much time in the company of other men, nor would he care so much about his appearance. Mm -hmm. So they're involved in this whole kind of PR dimension around this. And then they also become kind of early entrepreneurs where they're selling Mm -hmm. fitness devices devices to use mostly at home because you'd be embarrassed if you're a man to be seen exercising, wanting to exercise. And that kind of begins this project of like sanitizing it. And for women, and I know I'm talking at great length, I'll say this really quickly, but women were also seen as suspicious for wanting to exercise, but for other reasons. Of course, for women, it was totally normal to want to look pretty and like focus on your body. Like that wasn't strange, but it was the athleticism of it that was really suspicious. And so women who excuse me, wanted to exercise or lift weights were considered uh, suspiciously not feminine enough because why would you want to build muscles? That's masculine. That could hurt your uterus. You wouldn't have babies. That if you wanted to do more like sports or even even lifting weights as these guys did, um, that will cultivate kind of unfeminine characteristics of individualism and competitiveness. And so early on, that's kind of working against women and the people who are successful in kind of promoting women's exercise early Early on tend to say that, you know, women should do group dance because it's about grace and it's a group activity. And so you see that in the kind of PE, like physical education conversations, but that's the beginning of like stripping that away. And then effectively it gets sold in some of these devices and some entrepreneurs. And then there's like a big shift in the middle of the 20th century where the federal government um, for a range of reasons from the new deal to the cold world war II a little bit, but the cold war, especially gets very invested in this idea that being fit and having a strong body is an act of civic good. And that's huge in terms of like the morality. And then uh, sadly, it's not the federal government that actually is like, so therefore we should have free and accessible exercise for everyone. They say that, but they don't really do that. But it's really the fitness industry that like runs with that and sells you the idea. You're a good person if you work out. So buy this membership. And if you can't afford it, you're a bad person. And that's kind of where we are today. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, the, the title of your book is perfect because fit nation, you know, this idea that like how this um, how fitness and exercise and physical health fit into a uh, conception of what America is. And, you know, you, I mean, you mentioned mm-hmm. the World's Fair as being a starting point. I can't think of the World's Fair without thinking of it as like basically a big show about mm-hmm. uh, nation and patriarchy uh, and gender. I mean, race, all of that stuff is really, really powerful there. I wonder, like, um, in the Cold War moment, is it is it is it like anti-communism is a part of this, like the idea that we have to uh, 
sort of compete now on the world stage. And, and a part of that is going to be getting our kids to do jumping jacks in school. For sure. And that's kind of a familiar story. Like I drawn some other wonderful scholars who've looked at this, although I went back to the primary sources too, which was so fun and sometimes revelatory of things I don't think have been told anywhere else. But yes, to answer the first part of your question, totally a Cold War project. So World War II ends and, you know, America's doing pretty well. It seems like you have suburbanization. There are more affordable homes for white people. For the most part, you have these middle-class suburbs that are popping up. And, you know, a few people, notably a woman named Bonnie, Pruden, who lives in White Plains, New York, notice that, wow, the so-called American good life is not that great for American bodies. And she starts getting really worried about kids who she says are subject to what she calls the tyranny of the wheel. So they're being like pushed around in strollers. They have cars to take them everywhere. They're watching TV. They're just not as physically vital as they once were. So these are mostly like white middle-class children. There's also a worry because the service economy expands in this period that especially men who are working desk jobs are going to have heart attacks. Like there's, um, I'm not forgetting the name. It was called a cardiac, the cardiac scare. I'm not mm-hmm. now forgetting. It's something like that, but a lot of fear about that. And so that is positioned as a personal health issue, but really as a national security issue, particularly with children, that yeah. these kids are not going to be fit enough to fight. And so Pruden gets the ear of Eisenhower, and that's a huge thing. Um, she gets some professional athletes and doctors to kind of have her back, and they present this idea that, that this is a huge problem. And Eisenhower, being a general, is like, yeah, I'm on it. And he kind of advocates for this very like militaristic kind of soldier and training approach approach to fitness, which is powerful in, in promoting kind of phys ed and that this is a civic virtue, but really it's JFK who runs with it. And JFK is so, um, wonderful. Sounds like I embrace everything he did, but powerful and effective, let's say in being a real fitness influencer, I would say early on, you know, he did suffer from all these health ailments, which we didn't know about till later, but he's the picture of health, right? And he's Mm -hmm. a swimmer at Harvard and he's on the beach and West Palm and in uh, the Cape. And, you know, he really amps up the patriotism rhetoric around the Cold War. He goes and writes in Sports Illustrated about the problem of the soft American and everybody needs to um, be fit. But he also kind of says like, this should be fun and this is for the whole family. And he drops the youth from the Presidential Council on Youth Fitness, just the Council on Fitness. And he said, girls should be in on this, parents, and kind of makes it more of a lifestyle thing. That is super important and absolutely part of the Cold War. The thing I that was one then that I think, you know, to students of this general period, I feel like you kind of know about this a little bit. One thing that I found so interesting on the Cold War front and speaks to how persistent that sense that mind and body are disconnected is, is that, you know, the other narrative we have about Cold War educational priorities is the one around the National Defense Education Act, right? That what we should do is um, really seed math and science and technology programs in schools because the Russians are like sending people to the moon and American kids are dumb um, and that's not working out. So what I did not gather (laughs) is that until I went back to these sources is that the kind of cold warrior phys ed crowd and the national defense education crowd were at each other's throats. And they actually believe that the other one is um, detracting from the F from their efforts. And so you see these people who are kind of pro what we would call STEM education today. Like, why do these people want kids in PE? Don't they know that's a waste of time? Push-ups aren't going to, you know, get us to world domination. And then vice versa, you see the PE people like, you know, if we're not, you know, if we're not fit to fight, um, then we will never be able to do anything. Thing. And it's the PE crowd also that begins to articulate a little bit of this notion that mind and body are connected. Like they, it's only very incipient, but they start to say something which I think is very, very obvious today. And most people say, which is like actually having these kids be more fit would it might actually help them academically. Like these things go together. But at that point, everybody is talking about this as a kind of zero sum game. You either have PE yeah. or you have more math, and that is a really unique um, kind of cold war 
core conversation that speaks to some that really I think is revelatory of attitudes about the body and the mind and all that at the time. Yeah, and I'm I, the I'm thinking about Teddy Roosevelt and his sort of like you know I mean the the masculinity and the um the the sort of like um the racial hierarchy element of the strength uh, of young boys going into the the frontier. I mean, there's just a notion. There's a, it, seems, it seems like there's a struggle over the meaning of exercise and fitness within that national conversation where you have like Roosevelt being like, you have to be strong. We need strong boys to dominate Native Americans. I guess he would call them Indians, but like we need we need strong white boys in order to like basically keep our system going the way we're going. Whereas JFK seems like in, by the time you get to the 60s, it's still nation. But there's like a softening of it a little bit. I mean, even with gender, right? It's not quite cl- quite as clearly about like men being strong. Right. It, JFK definitely softens that. And the kind of racial, racial, racist tones of it are much, much more muted. I mean, the language and the official policy documents of the various presidential councils on fitness, youth fitness, whatever you want to call it, um, they all say children of all race, creed, color, like they speak in that universalist tone. So different, as you mentioned, from Teddy Roosevelt, who's like an unapologetic mm-hmm. kind of white supremacist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what I think is super interesting and important important to point out is that even that Eisenhower JFK era of this stuff, even though they speak in these universalist terms, they're basically only worried about white suburban kids. They're never talking about people of color. They're never connecting issues of physical health that might be partially at least remediated by exercise um, that are happening in inner cities um, and affecting people of color. They're never making that connection. This is very much about the problems of affluence. Like in the PSA Mm. campaign, It's a middle class thing. Yeah. A hundred percent. You see again and again, like, oh, push button luxury is going to destroy this generation. And it's interesting because it's a moment when, um, and they have all kinds of like terrible fat shaming bodies to like fat kids and, you know, adults with no head, but just this big bulging belly. And it's really this moment where you also see um, the kind of last gasp of fat means rich, not in a good way. They're knocking it, but by the time you get to the Obama gener- the Obama administration, where a lot of people are like, oh, it sounds a lot like the Kennedys. I'm like, yeah, it does sound like it. But just think, the Obamas are really gearing their message towards black and brown communities whose one of their main issues they're tackling is obesity. And that's a real shift in who's considered the kind of problem and what that problematic body looks like. So the race angle is never not central to all of this, but it looks very different from the Teddy Roosevelt days to the Eisenhower JFK days to the Obama days. Right, right. Um, there, there, you mentioned in your in your book that growing up in in a city and having only sports and dance available to you. Yeah. Um, and I mean, when growing up, I, I I recognized that not not in the sense of those two options, but in the sense of feeling like there wasn't a physical activity available to me as a kid that I would be into. Right. Like it's, it seemed mm-hmm. like it was like, like kind of like you're being filtered into one thing or another. Um, and it seems like that 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 corresponds to gender that corresponds to race that corresponds to a lot of different things. Um, can, can you talk about how you how you like basically learn to love exercise? Because uh, um, it's something that, I, you know, growing up as a as a as a nerd uh, with jock brothers um, that were very much, you know, football, baseball playing dudes. It was a part of the like identity formation, honestly, of like who I Mm -hmm. am uh, was was like what I do with my body, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do or don't do. Right. Right. Um, And I think it definitely plays out pretty differently around gender for sure. I mean, still now my kids, ironically, are like the sportiest kids you'll find. But um, my friends who have all boys who are not at all into sports are like, it's still actually pretty hard to have a boy who doesn't gravitate towards sports. But I digress. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So for me, I have what uh, some people would call adult onset athleticism, which I think is a funny term I didn't make up. But um, my story (laughs) was... So for me, I was growing, I'm 44. So I was in high school in the 1990s. And, you know, that I was part of that generation of the kind of daughters of Title IX, right? I never knew an era when girls didn't have access to organized sports, which is phenomenal. But I think it also really did in a lot of ways create this pressure where that wasn't something that you were supposed to opt out of necessarily and where you kind of felt like that you should do that. And I was never athletically talented at all. I was always super intimidated by sports. Um, 
um, dance. They all seemed so exclusive and kind of, you know, there were cuts and tryouts and auditions and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, then PE was also really hard because there was still that holdover from um, the Kennedy era of all those ranked things, rope climb and the mile timed mile and all those things. And I just never felt good at them and whatsoever. So kind of a long story short, but this all came to a head junior year of high school. And I exercised an arcane rule in the student rights and responsibilities manual that said, well, you can opt out of phys ed where I continue to feel very humiliated if you do a supervised extracurricular activity in a, in like something physical cannot be an organized sports team because they didn't want all the athletes opting out. I'm like, well, I'm not about to go be on a sports team, so don't worry. <laughs> but the two options that the PE department chair gave me were either personal training, which was a brand new field at the time, or a group fitness class. And I remember I went home and my parents were like, personal training, like we've heard of that. Only rich people do that. Like no way. Um, but group fitness, we belong to a Jewish community center and there they had classes. And so, I mean, I kind of knew what they were. I remember my mom sometimes went to this place called women's world, which was kind of an aerobics place when I was little, but, um, I didn't really know what it was as something I would participate in. And I walked in, I guess it was 1994 and 95 to a step aerobics class. And like Natalia was born that day, <laughs> maybe not that day, <laughs> yeah. but it just felt so different. I felt like I discovered this world in which. I could work on my body and be in my body and not just have it be this thing that sort of carried around my brain, which I was very proud of. And, you know, I was the nerd too, mm -hmm. um, but I could love it and I could develop strength and it was so cool. And um, that for, I, now I look back and I think, okay, maybe that's really where the genesis of this book happened and realizing there was this other world called fitness that wasn't sport. And like, where did that come from? And um, yeah, so that would be sort of the beginning. And then after that, so I became like kind of a gym rat and it was funny. We taught, we started off talking about mind body dualism. I was so like bought into the idea that these were separate realms, that it was almost kind of funny. Like, oh, here I was this like brainy girl going to an Ivy league school. And I'm like, in another life, I'd be an aerobics instructor. And I was working behind the <laughs> desk at a gym and I love these classes. And, you know, it's obviously very arrogant that I was saying that, like I was somehow superior to this, like how ridiculous I would dream of this. Um, but, um, I, I was always sort of working and working out in these fitness spaces and pursuing the scholarly, uh, mm -hmm trajectory. And, you know, it's, there were a bunch of, bunch of twists and turns there, but eventually as a historian, I was like, I want to understand this better. Like, how did we get here? Um, not just my own life. By then I had like run marathons and I was a fitness instructor, but um, I want to just understand how as a culture, we came to have this world that's both really, really exclusive, but also sort of universally celebrated as representing something good about people. If you choose to work out. Oh, you must be disciplined. You must be virtuous. You must care about right, health. Like, right. Where did that come from? So that's kind of like, you know, my little story you asked about how I got into fitness, but also how that 1990s step class got me to write the book. I'm ready, <laughs> you know, to come out in 2023. Well, it's also, I mean, the, the fundamental paradox you're dealing with in your book is the, the idea that fitness is everywhere in America. We're, we're obsessed with fitness. And yet at the same time, there's this, uh, I mean, there's a weird culture about it, but there's also we're not super healthy as Americans. And that 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 right. paradox is something that's difficult to square, but at the same time, maybe make not difficult when we think about how, I don't know, sequestered and segregated access to exercise is. I mean, I, I, I've, you know, working class people, people who are uh, working physical jobs, even, you know, I. Uh, People working at Amazon work uh, warehouses, people working construction, they don't necessarily want to go to the gym. Their their life is working out, and and mm -hmm. and that part of it makes me think a lot about sort of what you're writing about. Yeah, no, so many interesting things in what you just said. Well, first, I would say about like people who are engaged in physical labor. Yeah, there's no question that the kind of fascination or emphasis on fitness in this country comes from the fact that the service economy here has expanded and expanded. So as more and more people are doing sedentary work, there's more and more of a kind of marketplace for the idea and that you have to make time in your own life to do this physical work because your day to day doesn't involve right, it. Right. And that has to do with the nature of work, but it also has to do with the nature of um, settlement, right? If you live in the suburbs and you're driving somewhere, sitting on a train and you have these long commutes, you're not actually um, moving. 
Now it's interesting with manual labor, you're right that if you're working with your body all day, you don't want to go to the gym, but I do think it's really important to push back on what I think is sometimes, um, you know, argued, which is like, oh, when we used to like work with our hands, we didn't need the gym. And like, yes, that's true because you were, there was, you, you were moving more, but like, you know, you can look today at people who are, as you said, working at Amazon or working in these physical jobs. They're not in this like workout, uh, sort of like healthy program. They're doing repetitive movements. They're getting overuse injuries. They're on their feet all day. So physical labor does not translate to a kind yeah, of smart it's weird. exercise program. Yeah, it's weird to wish for the kind of like labor dynamics of previous ages that were so yeah. exploitative. And it's not like all of those, um, those people who worked to build this country uh, as we often like to like to put ideologically, they were super healthy because they worked in uh, factories or did yeah. construction. Um, they they were exploited, and that's that. I mean, and their bodies suffered. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then I think also to your other point about the central paradox about the book of like how are we so obsessed with exercise as a good and yet such an unhealthy country? Well, yes, of course, I'm interested in the exercise angle, and that has everything to do with the defunding of the most affordable and accessible forms of exercise, physical education public parks, recreation, pools, all those places that people actually could be active freely and things beyond specific facilities like street lights, clean streets, like, um, you know, tree overhangs to make places cooler during the year so you can exercise. All those things really, really matter. Um, but I think really important, um, wait, I just lost my train of thought. Hold on. That's right. uh, yeah, hold on. Let me just get a fact. Um, oh yeah. But I think really important to emphasize as well is that like exercise is not the only key to health. Like huge changes in our food system have also had everything to do with the ill health of Americans. Like, you know, since the 1980s, the expansion of fast food and the subsidies for very unhealthy food, making it the most affordable and the, thus mm -hmm. the smartest right. thing to, to, to buy, um, have been crucial to the kind of ill health of Americans. So has the high cost of health care. So has, I mean, there's so many things. I, I love the book by, I love, but I'm disturbed by the book by Chin Ju called Supersizing America, where she goes into small business administration records in the 1960s and looks at how the easiest businesses to seed for African Americans in their neighborhoods were fast food businesses because it was a small footprint and you could like get it up very quickly. That's why there are so many fast food restaurants in these neighborhoods and not like big grocery stores with fresh right, food right. and footprints. And I think all of that stuff is too big for one book, but I try to gesture to all these things so that my readers are like, okay, exercise is central to this issue, but this is not a monocausal argument here. Let me go read all these other things in yeah, all of my yeah. notes section that kind of lay it out. It's about housing, food, um, everything, work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that that's the, your book is mind blowing, honestly, because it is tapping into a, a, a sort of central place uh, where we talk about what the fuck is an American body supposed to be and how do we achieve that within the political economy that we have and the culture that we have? I mean, I, you know, I was I'm the same age as you. I'm 44. So I was too old to get sucked into like the Joe Rogan sort of world. But I feel like a lot of my students, mm -hmm. young men, especially I mean, can we talk a little bit about that culture? Because it seems like the kind yeah. of like kettlebell, <laughs> the kettlebell dude culture um, and MMA is obviously related to it. I know you don't touch on all of this stuff in your book, but mm -hmm. it's hard not to think about, um, you know, these what 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 my body is supposed to look like and what that reflects and how that connects to, you know, Trump as a strong man. I mean, there's so much. Yes. A strong man who hates exercise, by the way. So <laughs> I mean, that, you know, yeah, yeah, totally. So you, Trump is actually, I mean, there's a lot in what you said there, but just to pause on Trump for a second, Trump is so unique across both political parties as a modern president and actually saying, I don't exercise. And I think it's bad. Like everybody else, it's uncontroversial. George Bush loves to go running. So does Jimmy Carter. Obama's the fittest president ever. Jo Donald Trump is like this older model of an elite who's like, I want to eat hamburgers or, you know, well done steak and ketchup. And I think that you suckers who are out there working hard are actually, he would say, depleting your battery because he believes in this 19th century science. But anyway, so that that is unique. But what but yet there are like very Trumpy types, right? Like you're mentioning who kind of see this um self-fashioning through the gym as a kind of like old school raw masculinity. There's quite a bit of Teddy Roosevelt in there. I oh, think yeah, that yeah. idea. Um, cringe it's too. 
Yeah, it, it is. But I actually feel like dispassionate enough as a researcher to be like, oh, I actually kind of feel like I understand what's going on here. I mean, very similar <laughs> to the early 20th century. There's a very strong discourse that um, argues, particularly on the right, really only on the right, but that um, young men are being overly feminized and that there's this feminizing culture that's encouraging them today to be emotional, to apologize for being a man, to not even be able to... Um, you know, kiss a girl without like getting a form signed or something like that. Like this notion that kind of like conventional forms of masculine expression are being beat back and boys are made to feel guilty for that. And so there is what steps in, well, a kind of like traditionalist approach to masculinity, which is about building um, not exactly brute strength, but kind of more Sandow strength, which is like deliberately building strength, unapology unapologetically leaning into that kind of raw masculinity. And um, I get where that's coming from, quite honestly. Like it makes sense. Like the, the impulse to fashion your body as a form of self-determination and kind of resistance is so American and so embedded like across the political spectrum. I totally actually get that. And so it doesn't surprise me that a kind of form of bootstrapping and resistance for a lot of guys is like, screw it, let's go lift heavy and like, you know, slam protein drinks or whatever. And so that kind of makes sense to me, both in the specifics of kind of embracing embracing a kind of brute masculine strength in a moment where a lot of boys and or guys feel like that's not something they're allowed to express mm -hmm. and the kind of more general impulse that we've seen really like in women too and across the political strength political spectrum that like a way to realize the american ideal of individualism is to take control of your own body and not say, I'm going to wait for some doctor to tell me what to do or some, or, or someone else to tell me, you know, who to tell me that they know better about my body, but I'm actually going to claim that strength for myself. And mm. that's been a very appealing proposition. Um, I argue certainly since like at least the 1960s, but I think you see it in the early 20th century too. So I, I get where that's coming from. Makes sense yeah. to me. It's yeah. being expressed at the gym. Yeah. And, 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 and exacerbated by, by pandemic too the the idea of i mean just the way uh, the 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 nation uh the united states has handled the pandemic is is you know gone in a, little, a lot of different ways but one of them is is towards that that sort of self-determinant kind of idea that like you know you i decide what i uh, what 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 is good for my body i decide whether or not to wear a mask or do a vaccine or mm -hmm. something like that um I wonder about the the gender elements because we we mentioned jane fonda in the 80s and i love that idea because you know i I grew up um, and was introduced to Jane Fonda, and I actually wrote about her in my book about Vietnam, the Vietnam stuff. But I didn't know about any of that stuff as a as a young person. I just was introduced to this this exercise person, um, and and I I do see it as a continuation in a weird way of her work on the left in the sixties and seventies towards social justice and things like that. Um, but particularly when it comes to feminism, so I wonder if you could think a little bit about that because my, you know, I remember my mom going to jazzercise classes uh, when yeah. I was young, and it was a, it was like a thing, you know what I mean? Like it meant it, it felt yeah. like she had she had seen this on TV, and like she's gonna go be in the jazzercise class, and it felt like it was social uh, as much as it was physical, um, but it felt like it was aimed at middle class suburban housewives in the eighties. Yes. And, you know, it's funny, you do, you're doing something fairly common, which is to conflate Jane Fonda and Jazzercise. They're actually pretty different. They're similar in that it's that dance aerobics boom of that moment. And mm -hmm. I've inter I've never interviewed Jane Fonda. I interviewed the founder of Jazzercise and I sort of was like, oh, was there, you know, competition? And she's like, actually, when Jane Fonda became very popular through the VHS uh, right, distribution, right. which was huge for Jane Fonda. Jazzercise never really got into that. Jazzercise actually. So this is home too. versus gym again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because right. Jazzercise really focused on building these centers as opposed to doing um, VHS distribution. Um, and there also wasn't a celebrity behind it. But um, yeah, I think it's really, I did almost interview Jane Fonda. I had a long conversation with her people. And I think the thing that got me closest to getting in, and then I didn't sadly, but um, is that the, the, person I was talking to was like, wow, you're one of the few people who seems to actually connect her activism with her feminism, with her fitness stuff. Like often the fitness stuff is a little bit like 
laughed at as like this silly moment or like it's, she wasn't being a serious actress. Right, right. She wasn't being a serious activist. And I think that's so wrong. And I think that's, she didn't see it that way. I mean, she, um, you know, she, as I mentioned, she founded the workout in order to fund Tom Hayden's campaign for the Campaign for Economic Democracy. She talked very much about having struggled with disordered eating and then finding exercise as a way to have a much more positive relationship with her body. She's doing this at a moment when, you know, women, um, it's kind of like late second wave feminism. So women have access to credit. There's been all these like bodily autonomy movements, like they're working more. Um, and so the opportunity to be in these spaces and come together isn't just about like thinning your thighs and like getting a slim waist. It's actually this place for bodily empowerment. And I think that I understand why that's been diminished. I think also, I think it has to do a little bit to do with like sexism in the history profession of like, oh, this silly thing ladies do like, you know, haha, especially when it's not overtly political. Right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think that even his, even like scholars on the left who are quite open to say, oh, you know, Jane Fonda and anti-war um, activism and like this policy work around the environment, like that's very serious. But oh, that little aerobics and leotard thing, because right. that's a primarily female and feminine space, it still gets kind of diminished. And so I think that is really something that I'm like, resisting so much in my work um, and kind of trying to take seriously women's consumer spaces, um, which are fitness spaces. The, I will say I do understand some of the resistance to take not just Jane Fonda, but this kind of women's fitness world seriously, because it is true that there's a lot of kind of hegemonic, patriarchal, body hating stuff that goes on in there. Um, and I, I do not try to paint that, um, you know, like paint over that or right, look right. at the rose colored lenses. It's a very important part of my book to take that seriously and its impact. But I think that we can be too quick to kind of disdain this as just silly or just kind of patriarchal and oppressive. And it's actually much more interesting. It's and the Jane academic a thing still, you know, I yeah. mean, it's, we still, I, we don't expect academics to have much of an engagement with physical fitness, which is a weird yeah. thing. Like I still think of like, if a, if, if a, if a professor is about to give a lecture uh, uh, and, 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 and comes in, in front of the, in front of the audience, like, and it's this big yoked dude with huge muscles. People aren't going to think that's the professor, right? Like we just yeah, do not yeah. associate those things. And I think there is, yeah, definitely, especially in the humanities, like a, a kind of knee jerk, uh, you know, dismissal of, I mean, we, sports, uh, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I don't know. I, I, we're lucky in that we've been, I went to graduate school in the two thousands and there were a lot of people who were, you know, working on sports history, working on changing these attitudes. And 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 I feel like the, the kind of work you're doing is included there. Um, in Thank sort you. Of like, you know, getting over this because it, they are, they shouldn't be thought of as two separate worlds. It's actually kind of bizarre to think of them as opposed. Yes. And you, there are at least two things I want to pick up on in what you just said. You keep having these great questions that raise so many other points. Um, but one for sure, like sports history laid the foundation in many ways for what I'm doing. But it's interesting that even among sports historians, I sometimes need to be like, no, 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 this matters too. It's not sports, but I think, and I don't mean to make it all about gender, but I think it does have to do with the fact that you have people who are like more than happy to read like a multi-volume history of like the major league baseball, but they're like, oh, fitness, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like that's kind of like silly. And I think we are shifting and it is part of that same direction. I think that that is, um, really important. The other thing that you said about like what we expect a professor to look like, like that's probably its whole own podcast series. <laughs> but um, there's this piece that I cite in the book and I wish it were longer because I would read, I'd read like a whole book on this, but it was a piece that came out in the now defunct magazine Pacific Standard. And it was written by a journalist. Um, I think the title, the headline was something like how the other half lifts. And this guy was, um, you know, kind that's of a Ill, great Ill, title. Yeah, a kind of intelligentsia type, a journalist. And he was a try contemporary. He's a triathlete. And so he has that kind of, you know, conventionally thin, wiry triathlete's body. And he said, is like, that's very acceptable in my social and professional class. You know, in a way it wouldn't have been in the seventies when like, oh, you're a weirdo, you're doing all these extreme sports. So he talks about that, but then he gets into powerlifting and his whole body changes and he kind of loves 
in some kind of a little bit like fetishizing working class stuff, but he kind of loves the way he looks and the bulgingness of his muscles and all that. But he sees the discomfort of his wife, of his social circle, like, dude, what are you doing? Like, because like we do live in a world where now fitness culture is so expansive that what a fit body is actually looks really different depending what community you talk you talk to. And that kind of like bulging jacked physique tends not to be associated with someone doing cerebral labor. But, you know, a distance runner, I don't think anyone anymore thinks that's weird, right? That's like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Right. Like uh, Murakami wrote a book about uh, uh, jogging and there's a, you know, there's a real cerebral intellectual writer's life Mm -hmm. about jogging. But yeah, powerlifting, not quite the same. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about a a friend I had that was a literature PhD who went off years later. I see him on Facebook and he started getting into powerlifting and he's fucking huge. And I'm like, (laughs) so weird, dude. Like he's lecturing about Oscar Wilde and he's also like this jacked guy. And I'm like, well, squaring that seems important. You know? Yes, totally. That shouldn't be so weird. Um, Yeah. Natalia Melman Petrozella. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I want to say the name of your book before we go. It's called Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. I can't recommend it enough. Um, It connects to so many things we talk about here. So thanks so much for, for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was such a fun conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, all right, my friends, I think that's going to do it for today's Nostalgia Trap. I want to give a big thank you to my guest, Natalia Melman Petrozella. It was great to actually listen to the substance of her work. Go check out that book, Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. Really cool history she's telling there. Thanks so much for tuning into the program. If you want more Nostalgia Trap episodes, bonus stuff, my own Trap TV psychedelic history explorations, you can do that at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Link is in the episode description. Thanks so much. Hope you're well. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.